here in this space today at the Lincoln Community Center and also to everyone who's uh, listening and watching from all over Wyoming and all over the world uh, via our live feed. Uh, it's good to see everybody. My name is Matt Stannard uh, and I am a member of the Southeast Wyoming Democratic Socialists of America uh, and the Democratic Socialists of America uh, we have a we also have a literature table uh, over here at this event for those who want to know a little more about DSA and what we do and what we stand for. Uh, and DSA is kind of how I want to start talking about uh, this event and the context of this event today because uh, Yana's campaign philosophy is very much like the campaign philosophy of Bernie Sanders who has been uh, endorsed by the National uh, Democratic Socialists of America, along with a lot of other groups. Um, and the, what, what Bernie's campaign and what Yana's campaign have in common is that it is a campaign that is not about a candidate. It is a campaign that is not about a singular person or a singular authority figure uh, who intends to just be just a better leader of the hierarchy than the leader that they are trying to replace. That's not what this campaign is about. That's not what the national campaign is about. And it's certainly not what the philosophy of Democratic Socialists of America is about. Um, in 2015, uh, DSA had less than 5,000 members nationwide. Now, in 2020, DSA has more than 60,000 members nationwide, uh, and of course, have endorsed Bernie Sanders. That campaign, Bernie's campaign, seems poised to win the Democratic nomination for president. Woo! However, will be facing fierce resistance uh, for that win. That fierce resistance not coming from ordinary people, not coming from ordinary working people, but from the billionaire class, the one percent, the one-tenth of one percent class, if Bernie does not prevail, if working class candidates do not prevail, that will be the reason. The reason will be that that hierarchy, that top of that hierarchy successfully fought back. And here's the problem with that. And here's the problem with us letting that happen. The problems that we face today climate change, climate disaster, climate crisis, poverty, mass incarceration, uh, executive abuse by our president, um, a fascist immigration enforcement system that locks children in cages, literally locks children in cages, endless wars, massive unequal access to uh, the social and economic goods the destruction of our public commons, those problems which constitute the crises that Americans are facing and, and truly that we are facing the world over are systemic problems. These are systemic problems. These are not problems that come from having the wrong billionaire in the White House, <laughs> the wrong millionaires in the Senate. If we could just get different millionaires in there, if we could just get different autocrats and oligarchs in there, then everything would be fine. We've been hearing a lot of that this week, haven't we? The problems that we are facing are systemic problems. The problems are not who is at the top of the hierarchy. The problems are the hierarchy itself. The problems are the hierarchy itself. Not a question of having the wrong billionaire in power. Not a question of having the wrong administrators and managers of all of this. They're happening because there is a material and economic and political hierarchy that runs this world that will sell out any of us for a few more bucks 
of profit, a few more bucks of profit for a few people. They're happening because of material and political hierarchy. And we don't change the managers to solve that. We become managers to solve that. We become the administrators to solve that. That's why we're here. That's what Yana's campaign is about. That is what the national movement and the international movement to push back against the abuses of the 1% are all about. And as you all know, being good climate activists and climate scholars, our lives hang in the balance. The life of our planet hangs in the balance. The state of Wyoming magnifies this same divide. In many ways, Wyoming is the microcosm of that divide. In many ways, Wyoming is the, uh, the, the laboratory of this divide. Its leadership has largely accepted that hierarchy. The majority of its leadership, the leaders on the majority side, the Enzies, the Cheneys, the Barrassos, the Mark Gordons, the Dan Dockstatters, and so on, they believe that this should be a hierarchy of billionaires and death merchants who run the planet. That the same billionaires and death merchants who run the rest of the planet should run Wyoming. And that we better not get in their way. Some well-meaning leaders in Wyoming, on the other side, some of whom we love, some of whom we work with on political causes every day, whom we have coffee with downtown and we talk to constantly about these things, and some of those folks believe that we can keep most of that system in place and just change around a few deck chairs and just change around a few managers and just slightly change the hierarchy. Just need a few better leaders, a few reforms. We lovingly want to push those folks further. We lovingly invite those folks whom we work with on all kinds of political causes to rethink and push themselves a little further and say that just as this world needs a transformation and just as this country needs a transformation, so also does the state of Wyoming need a transformation from being an extractive, exploitative state to a cooperative state in synergy with its people and in synergy with its national, natural environment. Yana is a candidate who is dedicating her campaign to building that movement and to pushing people forward. The difference between Yana and other candidates that you will see in this entire election season in the state and in the country is that Yana is not about rearranging deck chairs. Yana is not about just putting different managers in and just changing a few people at the top of the hierarchy. Yana is, uh, is dedicated to dismantling the hierarchy itself, to creating a movement that will last longer than this campaign, and that will be made up of all of us and all of you, because that's what we need to survive and thrive. That is what we need to survive and thrive internationally, nationally, and in Wyoming. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the next uh, senator, U.S. Senator from the state of Wyoming, uh, Yana Ludwig. my stump speech, Matt, when I said you could talk. Um, yeah, so um, so I want to just carry forward some of the themes that Matt was talking about. I mean, the one of the things that I think is most important to understand about what we're trying to do with this is that, that I am not trying to be the big dog at the top of some hierarchy. My role, as I see it in the state for the amount of time that we're in this campaign and possibly beyond, depending on what we decide to do with this, um, is more like the tip of a wedge. So if you can imagine like something that is wedge shaped and there's a tiny little tip to it and that that's the thing that's sort of, you know, bumping first into whatever is out there in the world. 
I'm that tip of that wedge. But that wedge is incredibly ineffectual if there aren't many, many other people behind me and pushing that wedge forward. And my goal for this year in some ways is to be driving a wedge into politics in Wyoming. And the name of that wedge is love. It is really about finding a politics that is about caring deeply about each other and caring deeply about the planet and caring deeply about our communities as we're moving forward. And that tiny little blip that is the tip of that wedge by itself is not gonna get very far if we aren't being able to actually put together a movement of people who are excited and they want a different kind of politics moving forward. And so my hope is that as I'm out here talking to people, we can get more and more people involved with that because this isn't just a garden variety political campaign. Whether I win or not is not actually the end game with this. Hello. Puppers get to come too. Sure. I know. <laughs> Puppers, yeah. Um, so whether I win or not, we are trying to build something this year that will actually take us beyond. And if I do win, then we get a really powerful voice in DC that's going to be willing to take on um, a lot of the politics as usual. Um, if folks want to know what that looks like, you can check out. We just released a YouTube video last night of me responding to John Barrasso, who made a series of completely inane comments on the floor of Congress, and I went ahead and did a point-counterpoint video with that. And so that's the kind of thing that that would look like if I'm actually in DC. Um, I do think that I'm the Bernie Sanders candidate in this race, and one of the things is that we, you know, Bernie Sanders has a very public record for a very long time, and I don't, and so I'm gonna um, depart a little bit from what Matt was talking about and actually give you a little bit of who I am and what my background is and what I bring into this race and the things that have sort of shaped how I see the state of Wyoming at this point. Um, and it's kind of a, a tale of two different versions of life that I've lived in the time that I've been here on this planet. Uh, and so the first one is that I was raised in a very small town in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan named Iron River. And Iron River was named for the iron ore industry. And by the time my family got there, Iron River was about a generation and a half out from iron ore having completely disappeared as the economic center of Iron River. And nothing had really replaced it. So it was a case of where a, a town relied on mining for its economic stability. And at some point, the boom and bust cycle landed on bust permanently. And my childhood had some very odd features to it because of that. We had kids frequently coming to school with no lunch money. The kids got very good at identifying who was not eating that day and sharing our lunches with each other. Uh, we had a lot of suicides. Uh, we had a lot of alcoholism. And that rippled out into our culture as kids in ways that children should never have to deal with. And it was about poverty. I mean, I grew up in a town that was, as much as anything else, characterized by massive poverty. And you see where I'm going with this. Um, this is a reality that I feel like Wyoming is starting to slide toward very quickly. It's already hit a lot of our small towns, and it's going to continue hitting. It's affecting our funding for education. It's affecting everything. That coal is dying, and we're still in some pretty serious denial about that. The framing that I think we should be using around coal is that it's in hospice. And what I mean by that is that we have a beloved member of the Wyoming family, the Wyoming community, that is dying a slow death. And just like when someone is in hospice, it doesn't actually do any good for either that person or for the people that are gonna be left behind to stay in denial about that. And I say beloved because, you know, coal is the reason why my kids have really good public schools. Coal is the reason why we have no state taxes, no state income tax. I mean, there's a whole bunch of ways that coal has been really formative for Wyoming and ways that we have all benefited from deeply. And yet, it's like that uncle that you never agreed with about anything, but they still show up with their Christmas presents and they're still part of the family. And that is who we have in hospice right now. The other reason why I want us to think about it as a hospice situation is that you would be dumb to not be planning for what happens after the death is over. And right now, everything that we've seen in the state legislature has indicated that they are dragging their feet horribly about actually diversifying our economy 
and starting to make the shifts that need to happen. And the last few days with our opening session have really not given me reason to hope that it's gonna be any different this year. So, so that's sort of the grim reality part. The other part of my background and the other sort of tale with this is that I've spent a big chunk of my adult life living in eco-villages. And so these are communities that have chosen to do the planning for what a post-carbon reality looks like. They've figured out what are the social and economic systems that we need to be doing. What does diversification look like? How do we actually care for each other if we back away from assuming that fossil fuels are forever? And so I've had two sets of experiences that show me two different, very real possibilities for where Wyoming might end up. And I have a very strong preference for that second option, for us doing planning, for us being compassionate, and for us actually leaning into doing this as deliberately as we can. And I know what that looks like. So I want to just share that little bit of my background because I think it's important to have people in public office who can think outside of some of these traditional boxes and who actually have grounded experience and know what it can look like to actually take care of each other in some really concrete ways. Okay, so that's a chunk of what I wanted to give you today. The other thing is related to what Matt was talking about with socialism. Um, and I actually want us to do something that's a little unusual for a campaign event and wonder if you'd come up here and gather around and help me map our economy for a moment and actually like look at like how do we do the economy right now and what is socialism in relationship to what we're currently doing. So would you humor me and come play a mapping game with me for a minute? Can you come up here and do that with me? Probably not too bad. If your arms are getting tired. You're good? Okay, great. All right, so. I've been doing this all over the state, and it's actually been pretty fun to see how different people respond to this. Um, so what we've got here is up at the top we've got capitalism, and down at the bottom we've got socialism or socialized systems, and then we have multinational scale and a local scale over here. And let's just start up here. So what are some examples of like multinational national capitalism that we have going on right now. Who are oil. some of those companies? Oil. Big oil. Uh-huh. Walmart. Walmart. <coughs> McDonald's. <laughs> Amazon. Yeah. All of these. Exxon oil com or petrol companies. Uh-huh. Exxon. <laughs> Airlines. Yeah. Okay, good. You're getting the idea. Big pharma, yeah, it's kind of big, big whatever. Big ag, big pharma, big all the bigs. We have a little bit of big data. Big data, yeah. Good, okay, what else? What else do we have up here? Coal. Coal, yeah. People technically lobby groups. Lobbying, mm, that's a big industry, isn't it? Shipping. Shipping, uh-huh. Okay, good, great. Tourism. Tourism, okay, and tourism actually could probably be kind of all over this, couldn't it? There's yeah. like tourism, so we can put, there's like international tourism and national tourism, there's local tourism, okay, good. I'm starting to segue a little bit into some other quadrants. Okay, cool. So then what are some examples of like more like state, local capitalism? We were talking about this earlier, Mike. Oh, sweet noises. Uh, yeah. Um, and wouldn't you call that something else like mercantilism? Because it's not, a, she's not agglomerating wealth. No, she's, she's not. I mean, there probably are some small businesses locally where people are getting wealthy, but we're going to talk about sort of what the implications are in these different quadrants here. But basically any of your like local, local biz. Local food. Local food. Where these would be more towards the middle, like mm -hmm. places that originated sort of locally, but it's grown into uh -huh. larger chains. Yep, okay, cool. Dentists. Dentists, yeah, so how about like local yeah. services? Coffee. <laughs> Coffee shops, yeah. State okay. education. What's that? State education. State education. So where actually would education be between capitalism and socialism? Well, we're so, Huh? You know, more than more than socialism, local socialism side. Mm -hmm. But we got a lot of national programs in there. Yes, 
Yeah, good. And then there's like a bunch of like curriculum development yeah. and that kind of stuff that's kind of up here that ties in down here. Yeah, cool. What else? <clears throat> So let's, let's do this quadrant now. So what are like, there's not really a lot of multinational scale <coughs> socialism stuff going on. So what about like kind of like national scale socialism? The highway systems. Highways. Post office. Highways, which are kind of all the way through. We have some roads that are county maintained and that kind of stuff. So the post office, yeah. Police. Police, which are kind of in here somewhere, yeah. Police, state police. Hospitals. Hospitals. And sometimes they've got some ties in up here, right? So there's some connections in there, right? Okay, so what else? Water. Social security. Water. Social security, like only the most popular government program ever in the United States. What about forestry management? National parks. Yeah, so national parks. Yeah, and forestry management Kind of, is going to kind of show up on all these different park levels. So we have county and city parks. Public lands, where is that one? Public lands, well, there's sort of subsets here, and it's either, either national or, uh-huh, cool. Hotels. Medicare and Medicaid. Okay, and so hotels are probably, it's like some of them are these big, ginormous chains and some of them are with Airbnb where would you put that Airbnb oh, Airbnb is an interesting economy. one right because it is kind of a sharing economy thing not that there aren't some you know I mean but it challenges still have a it. connection to multinational because it's a yeah sure does. I mean they're, 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 are you uh -huh. talking about the individuals who uh -huh. are home the there, yeah, so there's like Airbnb corporate and there's Airbnb local. And I think they're about to go public. But there's also Airbnb oh, are they? people who own like like the drive up rent in big cities, right? People who are like mm -hmm. essentially landlords, but instead of oh. renting out apartments, they like it's and it's more and more uh -huh. common that that's. Uh -huh. the, yeah, so Airbnbs are an interesting one that doesn't quite map easily. Public transport? Public transit. Yeah. That's. Do we have public transit? Oh, well, we do in Laramie a little bit. We do in Laramie a little bit. We don't have much in the state. I've never seen Laramie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Amtrak would be kind of here. All right, that's a statement. Okay, cool. So you're getting the idea that like when we talk about the economy, there's actually, it means really, really different things depending on what we're talking about. So one thing that is missing from this list that I want to add on here because it's a critical part of what I'm campaigning on is worker-owned cooperatives. Folks familiar with worker co-ops? So it's where everybody who is part of the company is a partial owner and partial manager of the company. They're a decision maker. They have the power to make decisions about their workplaces. And so my sense is that the problem that we're running into is this stuff like this is where it's really 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 problematic these are the these are the places where like most of the money flows most of the profits that are generated in the u.s economy end up in the hands of the people who own these companies or are shareholders you know or like the ceos of these companies and that kind of stuff and that the solutions that i'm most interested in are you know are sort of in this zone Okay, so my campaign, more than anything else, is about shifting us from this reality to the reality that's described here. So it's not about disempowering locally owned businesses. The line between a, lo a small locally owned business and a worker owned cooperative is very, very, very thin. Okay, like they're in many ways functionally very similar things. But this is actually what socialism at its most strict definition means worker ownership. So when I talk about wanting us to shift to worker ownership, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having businesses where people control it. So imagine for a moment if the coal miners at the Bel Air mine had been owners of that mine. How different do you think things would have played out? Like what's happened is that that mine and a number of other mines have passed from one millionaire to another millionaire to another millionaire. They've stripped as much profit out of it as they can, gone bankrupt, which has wiped out repeatedly the benefits that those coal miners have had. Sometimes they've had paychecks that they couldn't cash, 
because there was no money there. They basically have gotten repeatedly screwed every step of the way because it's just passed from hand to hand to hand up here. So if it had actually been owned by the workers, A, they wouldn't have been caught by surprise by any of that. They would have been making decisions about, well, what do we do? Do we sell? Do we close? Do we do layoffs? How do we actually do that? And I can sure as hell guarantee you that no one person in that co-op would have gotten a $2 million bonus <laughs> while they were closing the doors. You know, like nobody in a worker, like that has never happened to work on co-op where they're like, you know George over here, he's just so much cooler than the rest of us, like he should get $2 million while the rest of us are making 10. Like that just doesn't happen. And so we're really talking about democratizing the economy. That's the big theme here is that all of this stuff are stuff that like we have some say in, assuming that our elected officials are actually listening to us. This is their job, is to make sure that this stuff is happening in a way that is in alignment with actually meeting real people's real needs. And then what I would like to see more and more of is that worker-owned cooperatives become the norm in our economy instead of the exception. Like there's thousands of them in the US and it's still a tiny little portion of the actual economy. Okay, so does this make sense, yeah. folks? Okay, great, so when people are like, she's a scary socialist. <laughs> This is really what I'm talking about, and I don't think, I think the only people that that is scary to legitimately are the owners of these companies. <clears throat> and they should be afraid, frankly. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. <clears throat> it seems to me that what you, one of the things you're saying is that right now, this is where our government is. Yep. And our government really needs to move over here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and so when the word oligarchy has been getting tossed around a whole lot recently. And that's basically when like people with a lot of money buy the government. And that is essentially what we have right now. The NRA. Yeah, the NRA, you know, there's a whole bunch of, like this lobbying thing. This is the first time any group has put lobbying on this list. And I'm happy to see that pop up on here because I think that's a really important connective tissue in this whole thing. And so really our campaign is about trying to figure out like, well, what do our local communities actually want? And how do we build a sustainable economy back up from what those communities are actually asking for and needing? That's really what this is about. So. I feel like law firms connect some of this stuff to mm -hmm. the politics, to the interests. Mm -hmm. And those would be mostly local, I think, but mostly some that aren't. I think we've got some national ones. Yeah. Can we put credit unions on there? Yeah. Because I was yeah. just thinking about credit unions and mm -hmm. how they're run by their members. Yep. Yeah, and they're pretty local. Yeah, so credit unions are going to be down here, and local banks are going to be up here, and then, and then big banks <laughs> are going to be up here. Yeah, so I find this framework like super helpful to sort of sort through those kinds of things, and I do think that there is a hierarchy of what makes sense, and it's like this makes the least sense, like this makes sense. Some things make sense to put up here, like I think healthcare makes sense to put up here because the more people in the system, the cheaper it gets for everybody. And then what makes sense to actually be doing at the local level? And so one of the things that often happens with like the Democrat-Republican split, like the stereotype is that Democrats are all about big government and they're not about localism and they're not about community. And I actually think we need to absolutely be about localism and about community and look at like if we're gonna have a few big government chips that we're going to spend, where are we going to spend them? And like getting really discerning and clear about what's the best tool to be applying to these different things. And I would way rather have small local businesses and worker-owned cooperatives than more Walmarts and Amazons. We also can put nonprofits on there, like Safe Project and all kinds mm -hmm. of things. Yeah, and nonprofits could really be anywhere on this map, frankly. I mean, there are some like the nonprofit industrial complex, like that phrase has come about recently because there are, you know, there are some very ginormous nonprofits that pay their CEOs a ton of money and are not actually that cool. And then there's a lot of these like very grassroots small nonprofits. So nonprofits could show up in a bunch of different places on here. And worker owned cooperatives cooperatives can be for profit or nonprofit. That's right. Yep. Yep, so they're in different categories. But yeah, I think like small nonprofits for the most part flock yeah, down here. Yeah, and then there's like bigger, big nonprofits. There's not too many up here, but there's a couple that are 
very eyebrow raising, I would say. Um, Okay, cool. So, um, so one of the things that I want to say is that, um, you know, when we think about the economy specifically in Wyoming, so it's not only fossil fuels, but you know who the biggest uh, employer in the state is? State? State. It's actually Walmart. Really? Walmart is the biggest employer in the state. Yeah. Wow. I need to, let me double check that actually, but it's definitely the biggest of like, um, non-governmental things. It could be a little bit smaller than the state government, but like statewide, I'm sure in Cheyenne, it's you know it's the base and the state government. Um, so here's an interesting thing, and this is one of the ways that like this plays out very, very, very badly for all of us. So almost always when Walmart comes into a town, it destroys a bunch of small businesses. They go out of business. Um, Walmart doesn't pay any taxes. You know, they're one of those like 80 some huge multinational corporations that aren't paying any taxes and yet they're using our roads, they're using the post office, they're using all of these public services and they're not paying anything for those. Uh, they are also not paying their employees enough money and so each Walmart, the average amount of money that a Walmart store in this country costs us in terms of social services is a million dollars per store. It's a per huge, per year, it's a huge amount of money. And so this is like a classic example of how much Walmart is just extracting value from all of these other quadrants. And my background is fundamentally centered on community building. You know, I've not only lived in communities, but I've worked on things like the, um, the New Economy Coalition original policy group was one of the things that I worked on. I worked on um, I was one of the people in one of the projects that helped get that bill passed recently in California for public banks, legalizing public banks. So I worked on that project. I mean, it's all these different things that are fundamentally about community building. And something like Walmart destroys the fabric of community in a thousand different ways. And so one of the other themes that I really want people to understand that I'm geared toward is like, how do we use community as a leverage point and also as the end point. I mean, in some ways, that's what we want is to have communities that feel vibrant, that we're able to live good, high quality, socially connected lives with each other. And community is a leverage point for that. And this whole quadrant up here is almost designed to destroy community in every way possible. Homogenize, yeah, yeah. I mean, the idea. Mike and I were talking about this a little bit ahead of time, and like one of the reasons why this stuff is so offensive is because they assume that everybody's needs are the same, and they're not. You know, like what people need in New York City or Chicago or St. Louis is not the same as what people need in Rollins. You know, I mean, those are really different needs. Some of them are going to be the same. We all need to eat. You know, there's some things in common. But what I really want to see is that we get back to having like deeply diversified, very localized economies and we get these guys out of the picture. Now this is the rest of my life's work, you know, to try to get this kind of a shift happening. But this Senate campaign is partly an attempt to get in there and to actually be starting to influence things on a higher level so that we can move back to this kind of sustainable localized economy stuff. The these folks are trying to convince us we need things that we don't really need. Right. These people know what we need. Right. Yep. Yep, I think that that's right. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking at you and just open it up for like more conversation at this point. We could talk a little bit about the, the climate specific uh, implications of this. What's up? Sorry, we have put utilities in here as mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. assume. Yep. And where would, where would we put utilities? We could put it anywhere. They should be publicly owned. They should be publicly I think that's right. I think they should they be publicly are. owned. Yeah, where they are and where they are. should be are two different yeah. things. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. In, in most cases. Right. It depends on the utility. Like so there's power some. Power and gas. Kind of utilities yeah, up here. Probably like in, in this area, we're between local and. Mm -hmm. Some of them are local owned. Uh huh. Yeah. And the ones that are local owned tend to be more responsive and more responsible to the community. Mm -hmm. right, Jack, you know, Jackson has the, mm -hmm. I can't think of the name, but there's a utility company that's, that's locally owned in the Jackson area mm -hmm. who's putting in renewables and they have the ability to do that because mm -hmm. they're not restricted by the laws that govern the other utilities that serve Wyoming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Hi.
You could also do like private transport, so Uber and Lyft should probably be there somewhere. Mm -hmm. There's probably Greyhound as well, because the, as a contrast to the. <coughs> yeah, so where would we put those? So Greyhounds would. Greyhound's kind of in here. Oh, Uber and yeah. Lyft, I think, is also extracting Absolutely. wealth out of the drivers. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's Greyhound. Totally. Great totally. Great totally. Great great local great transportation great. a yeah. lot of mm -hmm. time. And interstate. Interstate, too. Yeah, the whole like sharing economy stuff has been a very, very, very mixed bag. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's given a lot of people the ability to support themselves without having to like make a big investment in something else. You can use exactly what you already own, and it has also like destroyed unionized cab companies. It's like done a lot of undermining of workers' rights, um, and it's also not a very good like profit margin the people that are doing it. I mean, it seems easy and it's super flexible and so it's like kind of sexy, um, but it actually isn't that great, you know? Those two, Uber and Lyft, I think Airbnb is a little more rewarding financially. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. But they're not good citizens, mm -hmm. um, any of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not actually helping our communities be strong and that's kind of the bottom line that I'm interested in. How do we create yeah. strong communities? Yeah, they don't help yeah. the people that mm -hmm. are doing the business. Right. You know, from what I've, the last 30, 40 years, there's been a movement towards privatization of public services. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and that really gets in the way of local communities and yep. local control. And mm -hmm. if there was anything to push back on, yep. I, I think that privatization movement yeah. is then not, not a good thing. It's, so that's what, do you hear this phrase neoliberalism that gets tossed around a lot right now? I mean, basically, neoliberal capitalism basically says everything should be privatized. And the bottom line for that is we are in permanent means testing and hunger games for everybody to get any of their needs met at all. They've talked about, for instance, like, you know, we've got highways on here. So there was talk about actually making 80 a toll road. And so, you know, and it's like, that would be disastrous for poor yeah. people for, for in this state. It would be a good way for them to pay their way. Right. The, the, right. The I mean, that's the upside. To for trucks, because what we've done right. is create this free mm -hmm. network for them to, be, and compared to what cars do. To right. Be, well, and that's this not, these big companies not paying their share. Yeah. I mean, that's part of what that relates to. But I think we've got to be thinking about, like, let's not sell off all of our public lands to private interest. There's a big move. And actually, Cynthia Lumps, I'm just going to pick on my main opponent here for a minute. You know, she actually was the founder of an organization whose specific goal is to get the feds to sell their land off to states, and it's targeting states that have already said we can't afford it. And so that's her backdoor way of ending up with a whole bunch of stuff privatized. And it's like, so, you know, the, the sort of neoliberal hellscape would be like, I have to pay to get on I-80 to go over to Vitavu, and I have to pay to get into Vitavu to be able to walk around in the natural yeah. world. And that's like, there's this whole package of stuff where like this kind of neoliberal mindset I think has been incredibly disastrous for us. And I don't want to see Wyoming with everything privatized. I don't want our schools privatized. I don't want our lands privatized. I don't want the roads to, you know, cost us more money than the taxes. Like, pay your taxes and then drive on the road, you know? Yeah, yeah Colorado has a whole lot of charter schools now because they weren't able to tax. Mm -hmm. um, what was it called? Tabor? Uh, tax payers, Bill of Rights or something. Mm -hmm. And so now their schools are hurting, so now there's a whole bunch of private or charter schools popping up, and mm -hmm. uh, it's really hurt their economy. They have so many national and multinational stores. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, hurt their economy. it's hurt their public services, mm -hmm. like their education system. I know it's better here in than it is at Fort Collins. Yeah. And it's getting eroded in here yeah. because we're not willing to do what we need to do to actually like reaffirm the power of the public schools. But I know I, so I, my son is 22 now and he's, he's a senior at UW actually. And um, I, we tried three different schools with him and we finally pulled him out of school. And this is in other states. Um, I wouldn't have had an issue with putting him in the public schools in Wyoming, but you know, we tried it in New Mexico, we tried it in Missouri, we tried it in Michigan, and it's like, it was all, I mean, Wyoming's got a really good thing going 
with our public schools compared to a lot of other states. And a lot of it is like how much the charters have encroached on it and also how much we're willing to actually invest in the public sector, including these guys doing that investment. And I'm sure it's just a coincidence that these people are supporting these. <laughs> just a coincidence. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> Part of the issues, not just with charter schools, but a lot of also privatization, is that it takes away regulation and right. regulatory yeah. power, mm -hmm. which means mm -hmm. they can do whatever. Right. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many ways that they can hurt people without being held accountable. Right. 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 And we even see that with housing, mm -hmm. and even with some landlords and mm -hmm. lack of tenant policies and protections. Right. We are terrible in Wyoming about tenant protections. There's almost nothing that protects tenants in this state. So I would love to see some of that stuff. I know somebody put tenants' rights on this, which I'm super happy about. Um, yeah, let me do one other little economy thing while we're standing up here with this piece of paper. So, um, so there's this interesting thing with capitalism. So basically, when you buy something, imagine that this whole big thing is the amount of money that you're putting in. So you are paying for the service or product, right? And then you probably are also paying for some amount of like administrative or like, you know, store minding kinds of things. That's the stuff that you actually value, right? That's what you think you're paying for. Unfortunately, though, we also have CEO and higher up salaries. And we also have profit for shareholders. And essentially what a socialist vision of the world says is, let's take these two things out of the equation so that we're really truly just paying for the value of the thing that we're getting. Okay, so CEO salaries and wages are 361 times what your average laborer's wages are. And it's even worse in the pharmaceutical and healthcare industry. They have the worst ratios going. So actually, one of the specific things that I am pitching that's part of my platform is a wage ratio law. Mm -hmm. So in the 1950s, the ratio was about 20 to 1 on average. It's now about 361 to 1. So I'm actually proposing that we go back to a mandatory wage ratio. So you can still make 20 times what your workers are making. It's still a huge difference, but it's not this. Okay? And so I think there are a number of things that we can do to actually like move back toward. And I, I am not nostalgic about the 1950s with almost anything, but I am with what the wage ratio was at that point. And this is also when labor unions were a lot stronger and when you could actually when there was an actual middle class, and you know, middle class at that point meant that you were able to, on one salary, a family could own a home, own a car, send your kids to college, have health care, all that kind of stuff, and you could do it on one salary. How many families are making it on one salary at this point? Not many. That's right, not many. And so this is really what we're talking about, is like, let's defang these folks who are the oligarchs who are running our world right now and actually move back towards something that is closer to this. Mm -hmm. Hey, Yana, while you're on this topic, mm -hmm. the things that we pay for, we used to pay for when we got something in a bottle, we had to pay for the, the, the deposit to the, pot, the mm -hmm. bottle. Mm -hmm. And now all this just falls on the municipalities, all of the trash, so mm -hmm. all of the waste mm -hmm. that these corporations mm -hmm. are making, it's just I just want to make it easy for you to buy cases and cases of plastic <laughs> bottles and you'll deal right. with it in the in the landfill and so mm -hmm. it's a real transfer of the yeah. cost <coughs> right. from right. Walmart to the city of Laramie for example. So there was a study done at one point um, that said that 17% of products that we buy, the cost of that is the packaging. And a lot of that is advertising. Mm -hmm. Talking us into buying shit we don't actually need is actually like a big part of this. And then, you know, the packaging manufacturers, like, they're lobbying to, like, not have any restrictions at all on what they can do, which is, of course, disastrous for the environment, right? A whole bunch of other stuff. So the other thing that's interesting to me about this thing is, like, one of the big topics that's up in this election is health care. And so 
30% of what we're paying for in healthcare is actually the private insurance industry, which is where CEO wages are the highest. Okay, so for the privilege of being able to say no to me when I ask if I, may I please go to the doctor? And they're getting an anesthetic 30%. with that surgery, please. Right, <laughs> right, right. And can I have an anesthesiologist who actually knows what they're doing? Well, a lot of times they, they, they want to deny the anesthesia because, hey, that's right. not in our network. <laughs> the, the worst horror story that I've heard in the last week, and I'm going to say it in the last week because I keep hearing really bad horror stories, but the worst one I've heard in the last week was a woman who went into labor prematurely, went to the hospital, she had good insurance, her husband had actually stayed in a job that he hated so their family would have good insurance. So they go to the hospital, they got hit with, I think it was $300,000 worth of bills because the insurance company decided that her daughter was a pre-existing condition. Oh my gosh. And they can just do that, you know, because they are like- The insurance pretty, started before she conceived? And that's- after. Before, I mean, yeah, the insurance I, started I after she conceived? I actually don't know the answer to that question, but the idea that, the, that your baby is a pre-existing condition, they lumped into that so that they didn't have to pay the bills. And so this family has been like devastated by this, and that's the kind of stuff that they get away with, mm -hmm. you know, in this kind of like, you know, free for all in terms of economics. My uh, marketplace policy this year, <clears throat> if I go to somebody in, it's a $750 deductible, so I was pretty excited about that. If I go to somebody in network, if I go out of network this year, $20,000. Mm -hmm. right. I have no idea if I have a private network. I know. Top, but, uh -huh. I think it is, but, 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 but